When Unifor was founded last year, one of its goals was to embrace young workers in low-paying, precarious work. But many young workers don't feel connected to the labor movement and see it as a relic from previous generations. It's something that may have helped their parents, but isn't helping them. And it may even be a roadblock when it comes to landing that all-important first job. Canadian HR Reporter's Roundtable on the Future of Labor Relations in the Private Sector asked panelists what unions will need to do to win over the hearts and minds of young workers. The workforce is, is changing. Labor conditions are changing, especially uh, for young people in this province and in this country. And we're seeing more and more underemployment, precarious employment for youth uh, here in Canada. And so um, they see unions as, as organizations that represented people like their parents, people who were in maybe Monday to Friday, nine to five type employment. Um, and that's not for them. And so messaging that comes from unions like, you know, the folks that brought you the weekend is incredibly effective for those who have weekends. But increasingly, young people <laughs> don't actually have weekends. Their weekends might be a Monday and every second Thursday. Uh, and so they don't see themselves fitting into union culture because it doesn't reflect the lifestyle and the work that they participate in. And so I think if unions are going to make themselves relevant to youth and to students, um, they need to start communicating that uh, they're applicable in, in any workforce and that uh, the benefits that uh, our parents enjoyed if they were working in a unionized environment are available uh, to young people and that unions will reflect young people more and more as young people start to participate in them. And because uh, unions are democratic um, organizations, uh, the more young people get involved and participate, um, the more that, that unions are going to reflect their priorities. But the Canadian Federation of Independent Business doesn't see unions as the path to a better future for young workers. It says they see the benefits of being entrepreneurial and self-reliant. They're turning their back on, on perspectives that are paternalistic or dependent on others to make their lives better for them. Uh, and I think that's the fundamental uh, issue. And I think, uh, um, you know, we're, we're seeing the benefits of, of a stronger entrepreneurial uh, uh, economy in Canada. Uh, Canada is very strong entrepreneurial, even compared to the, uh, the U.S. And those are the benefits that are creating a, uh, a stronger standards of living for, for people. We've had uh, substantial growth in real incomes over the past 20 years. Uh, they've, they've increased on the balance of about 25 percent in, in constant dollar terms uh, for average families and some families, uh, uh, especially the lower income groups, have seen higher increases in, in take-home pay over that period of time. So uh, even with the decline in private sector unions, we've seen an increase in the standard of living. Uh, again, bumps and, and uh, 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 scrapes along the way because of the business cycle, but on balance, we're, we've, we're seeing a much stronger, reliant, self-reliant economy than we ever saw before in Canada. But one panelist wondered if that entrepreneurial spirit was a choice, or if it was simply because highly educated young workers had no other option. Because they are out of school, with student debt, with nothing but energy and ambition, and they are shut out. The rule of thumb is that uh, for every one person that starts a business because they find no other options, there are two or three others that start business because they have the confidence to do something. And that's what the entrepreneurial uh, academic community has, has pretty well uh, shown in Canada and the U.S. Uh, over time. Changes, it's a very different than when I graduated. Uh, uh, engineering students were hoping to pick up a job for Dome Petroleum and, uh, you know, out west, and, and that was their, uh, their goal. But uh, in the intervening uh, 30 years since then, uh, we see students starting businesses in first year, uh, trying to make a go of it, changing decisions or changing their mind in second and third year, and, and hitting the ground running. And that's, that's a positive thing. We've seen the Youth Business Foundation is, is uh, uh, strong and vibrant, and it's creating this kind of uh, uh, mentorship in the universities that has been very positive. So the idea that young people are only starting their own firms because uh, they can't find a job for a, a big unionized company, that's, that's not true at all. But from the perspective of young workers, starting a business is just one piece of the puzzle and too many youth are being shut out. I, I represent 300,000 students in the province of Ontario. What we're seeing is, is a job market that's, that's leaving young people behind. And so, um, for example, um, there's a report that recently came out from the Canadian uh, Centre for Policy Alternatives showing that um, we actually live with two different labour markets in Ontario here. The, the youth unemployment rate is double that uh, of the adult unemployment rate here in the province. Um, and we're seeing a rise, a rise in precarious and underemployment for youth. Um, 
And so uh, on, on top of the fact that they've gone to school and they've paid the highest tuition fees in, in the country uh, and racked up enormous amounts of debt, those who take on debt uh, in the province of Ontario, it's on average $37,000 uh, in debt. It's very hard to start a business, but it's hard to do other things. Uh, it's, it's hard to start a business. It's hard to start a family. It's hard to buy a house. It's hard to do the things that we imagine we would be doing when we were going out uh, into the labor market. And the labor conditions are just uh, not conducive to that type of lifestyle and so we would love to see people starting more businesses and and being able to see that that shift happening however um, an indebted generation a very educated but a very indebted generation are going to have trouble doing that uh, and so I think we we need to widen the conversation to why are um, youth and students why are they in these precarious jobs why aren't they starting businesses more uh, why aren't they finding uh, you know jobs in their field or at least um, good entry-level jobs that have on the job training where companies are investing uh, in, in them as employees and, and we don't see that happening. But if unions are built on the concept of seniority, which in many people's opinion means they are protecting older workers and preventing younger ones from getting jobs, what can be done to get more youth in the workforce? There's all sorts of issues in front of the labor market, in front of uh, working Canadians, and some of them can be solved at the bargaining table and some can't. This is probably one that's clearly in the, another category, which is about economic policy. Uh, you know, we're five years out, happy birthday to the financial crisis, uh, from, uh, from uh, what happened on Wall Street and Bay Street. Uh, we were somewhat sheltered in Canada by that, but that's still having tremendous repercussions for the labor market uh, here in Canada and elsewhere. And so this is a broader weakness uh, in terms of direction and creating employment overall. Seniority and other systems work wonderfully when you have a growing economy. It's very simple for people at the bottom to feel that they're on a ladder that's moving up. And then also you have decent pensions and people retire and they go out and the machinery works. Uh, when you have a stalled and uh, stalling economy or a very weak economy, these things become more problematic. I think one of the one of the things for creating opportunities for youth there's there's always the question of you know these things are related we say let's keep a decent pension so that people can retire so that there's actual job creation we also try to create employment by getting investment uh, in our facilities uh, and one of the things we've said that it's growing trend around precarious work is around two-tier work mm -hmm. and ensuring that as a policy that we we will not embrace that the idea that you know you, you can work for $27 an hour and the person beside you will work for 12 and that will be forever more. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so keeping that bond and saying, okay, well, there's not a lot of jobs, but we're not going to maybe create some jobs by selling everybody out. Uh, so, but these are tough questions and most of, them, most of those answers, I think, lie above and beyond the bargaining table, which is part of our mission as well, to speak on those things. But as the unions reinvent themselves and re-examine these fundamental guiding historic principles like seniority. Occasionally someone gets up the nerve to say, is seniority working now that we have this valuable resource that we can't employ? Mm -hmm. um, and the discussion at this point is an interesting one because uh, apart from the economic realities, the conversation around the continuing value of seniority as a guiding principle mm -hmm. is eroded when the young people who can't get into the system are the sons and daughters of your most senior <laughs> members. All of a sudden the, the conversation changes and mm -hmm. shifts a little bit and there's much less of a conversation about selling out mm -hmm. uh, the older people in, in, uh, in favor of the younger people when it's actually their own children who they're anxious to see employed. Well, you got the I, broader conversation too, Elaine, because you get into defined benefit pensions, which is a touchstone of the uh, trade union movement. Um, Bill talked about two tier, but there's there are alternatives to two tiers, like there are graduated wage systems where there's an expanded wage grid where it may take you many many years to catch up, but there's eventually a catch up. Uh, which is quite different from, a, a, as Bill described it, a forever two-tier system. So the, you're, you're right that there's a, there's a need to have that discussion that goes after the sort of cherished traditional uh, you know, touchstones and tear them apart, re-examine them in a cooperative you know, collective bargaining session where it's not like forbidden to, as soon as you table that at the table, it shuts down the negotiations, you no longer have that discussion. We've got to get past that if we're going to put real meat to these bones of, uh, of having a cooperative workforce and start to take a close look at those things again. And as you said, I won't 
you know, jump in too much, but I, you know, that's exactly the point that we undertook in our last summer's auto negotiations. We spent too many months in hotels around here uh, uh, doing exactly that, where the most fundamental problem on the bargaining table was discussions about the workers who aren't there yet. Um, and we've seen uh -huh. different strategies in the uh -huh. U.S. versus Canada around that, uh -huh. where where we did end up with okay, the solution to this and ensuring we stay in the ballpark for investment is a very elongated wage grid, uh, not our first choice, um, but it is a, a means to address some of those fundamental economic realities which uh, which we face in that industry at that time. The neat part is if you hang around long enough, you hear all the same stuff again, <laughs> again, and again. And there is no monolithic problem, there is no monolithic solution, and there is no monolithic opportunity. I mean, this is really the stuff we were talking about. You know, you talk about youth unemployment. A friend of mine graduated and was rejected by every letter of the alphabet except W and Z. So he applied to Woolworths and Zellers and got rejected by both of those two. So, you know, was there hard, hard times before? Yes, for youth unemployment. And there will be again. Um, and the other thing, the study I've done of youth, I've noticed that they age. So that your issues now, <laughs> your issues now will change. All they need and is you're going to be to support them and a lot of patience. Exactly. No, it's just in time. And one of the things is, is the, the delayed onset of, uh, of you know, sort of as they've talked about of mm. really getting to those stages of, of having a home and having a mortgage and and any kind of different issues in your life. They they will all come, and then there'll be the youth of the, who become the youth will have a new set of issues, which will look surprisingly like the ones that we had when I graduated. It was hard to get a job, and the first job was the hardest. And then I disappeared into a vacuum for about five years, and then employers everywhere discovered us and said wanted us. And then as you went along, your your quote, you know, uh, acceptability to people or the attraction of people to, to hiring you, and that increased. So that really hasn't changed. And is there a problem with competing with other jurisdictions in Michigan? I remember sitting in on a panel of that in 1993. It's, you know, and that's 20 years ago. Same story today. Um, do unions have a perception problem? Yes, there is. Same one they had then. Uh, and, but as you go through time, people find solutions to pieces of the problem. The RAND formula, getting rid of that, is not a, a universal solution to anything. Uh, you know, uh, the, the union going to the broader societal thing is, is an interesting approach. Could be very expensive, might not, might not lead anywhere and chew up a lot of cash. That's a worry if you're trying to run a union from the business perspective. Um, but they're just all these little solutions that will, will help. The IBEW in the United States tried to, uh, or they've uh, attempted to take on the whole perception problem by putting out a video about uh, union work and the quality of it, not necessarily for employers or the public, for their own members, saying, look, we should be known as the union that provides a quality product. People should want to hire this union because we have standards and guarantees, and when you hire IBEW, you get this. It was quite a good video. If you haven't seen it, I'd encourage you to take a look at it. So we're going to have all these challenges, we're going to have all these problems, and the path forward will always be unclear. But I think that there's a little, everybody's got a little bit of the solution, but like I said, there is no monolithic solution or problem, and, and it's how we adapt and the speed with which we adapt. I think society now asks us to adapt faster. Whether or not we want that, we, we've, we're not given that choice anymore. But as bad as it's always been for young workers, youth are adamant that this time it's different. Tuition fees have rapidly outpaced everything, including inflation, food, rent, transportation. Uh, debt is skyrocketing. We've hit $19 billion of just federal student loans in this country. Um, and that, that time it took to get the first job to get into that vacuum that you were talking about is taking longer. And so everything in our lives is being prolonged. It's harder to get the first job. It's harder to then get the second job. It's harder to start the career. You're getting your house and your mortgage and starting your family later. And so we're seeing lives prolonged, lives put on pause because we haven't figured out how to invest in youth like we used to. We haven't figured out how to include them, um, whether it be by uh, providing them with education, investing in their tr skills and training, both in the public sector and in the private sector. Uh, and then making sure that when they are within uh, the, the workforce, like you were saying, uh, that they understand the benefits of being part of a collective. And this could be a cooperative, this could be a union model. Um, but that individual um, benefit 
benefits and rights are actually part of the conversation around collective benefits and rights. Uh, and so that they're what they have grown up with. And, and I don't know if I fully subscribe to this idea of, of youth as individualized. I, I, I see it as a trend, uh, but not as, as a blanket theory for everyone. Um, that that they youth will be able to adapt to this um, if those in power right now are going to be able to give them the tools to empower them to do this. And the problem is, is that we don't have the tools ourselves because we're drowning in debt, uh, because we can't find jobs, and the jobs that we can find are non-unionized, they're precarious, we're underemployed. Um, and, and I think that that really speaks to the situation at hand. And um, I don't want to sound alarm bells, but we are in a crisis. Youth are in a crisis in this country and in this province, and, and we need to start talking about how to fix that and how, how we're going to address that for the years to come. Uh, because I know that I, I, this is probably not a popular opinion, as I see that I'm one-sixth of this panel, um, but I'm not close to retirement. This is my first year of work. I have all of the years ahead of me, um, where, whereas, uh, you what know. What are you saying about us? <laughs> 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 uh, and so, <laughs> my career is going to look a lot different than, uh, mm -hmm. than than, than yours, and, and it's, uh, mm. uh, it's something that I'm excited to fight for, it's something I'm excited to be a part of the change in. Uh, we just need to get other people excited and other people wanting to be part of that change, and I think unions can really be keystone in that.